Changes in Ideology of the Kurdish Freedom Movement By the late 1990s, the PKK had already been forced to critically deal with the failures of what they called real socialism. Socialism not as it was theorized, but as it actually existed in places like the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, Cuba, and China. The reality before them was that many of the socialist nation-states were founded through national liberation movements, yet by taking the reins of the state, these movements also took up the reins of the tools used to oppress people. It didn't feel better for a person to be beaten by the baton of a police officer if that baton was the people's baton and the person doing the beating was now the same ethnicity as the person being beaten. Besides, many of the nation states formed from freedom movements ended up repressing other ethnic groups when they got into power. Not only that, but generations had passed in many of these countries without the state ever withering away as a promised part of the socialist transition. On the contrary, state power was strengthened and further centralized for some excuse or another. Finally, the socialist states had often repressed the self-organization of workers and citizens into their own unions and councils. The capitalist bosses had been transformed to state bureaucrats, but the workers and citizens themselves still had very little say over the decisions that affected their lives. In other words, the states had retained the major elements of capitalism, but just shifted the control over the rank and file from bosses and politicians to state officials. The mass popular movements in the Eastern Bloc against the socialist states, in which many leftists took part, forced those seeking liberation and autonomy in that time to revisit their path. The Zapatistas in southern Mexico, for instance, had started as a small group of hardline Marxist-Leninist organizers from the city, but was transformed by the communal and democratic values of the indigenous Mayans and eventually became an anti-state, pro-direct democracy and communal economy movement. The PKK itself had also been a Marxist-Leninist organization and, like most of its counterparts, had originally wanted to form a strong socialist nation-state. The previous reflections, along with their own failure to create an independent state, contributed to the position of self-criticism and reform that the party was already facing in 1999 when Abdullah Ocalan was arrested. Arguably an even bigger factor in the upcoming paradigm change was the Turkish state's absolute refusal to accept any hint of democratization, minority rights, or self-determination, complemented by the facade of democratic values in western states that hid their support for heinous regimes and the very opposite of democratic practices around the world. It was during his highly publicized trial that Ojalan began to synthesize many of the PKK's new ideas which he put forth in his defense. As he came face to face with the authoritarian nature of the Turkish state and the hypocritical cowardice he saw in supposedly noble and model western states, Ojalan wanted to delve deeper into the history of the state as the now dominant political institution the world over. 
he attempted to trace back the origins of the hierarchy and domination that led to the oppression of Kurds and of people worldwide and found the organization of the state to be humanity's second sin, with the subjugation of women as the first colony being the original sin and the direct precondition for the formation of states. Ojalan saw states as a major break with human society's natural democratic and consensus-oriented tendencies, their respect and even reverence for women, and their natural connection of humans with the rest of nature. The state was based on usurpation of society, and society and the state would always be in conflict as long as the state existed. This led to deep critiques of the party's Marxist-Leninist ideology, as Ojalan no longer saw the state as something that could free the Kurdish people and establish democratic society and socialism. Rather, according to Ojalan, the nation-state was the fundamental tool that made capitalist hegemony possible. Of course, from this point on, there was no way that the PKK under Ojalan's thought leadership could continue to advocate for a nation-state while remaining anti-capitalist. The coming into prominence of the Kurdish regional government in Iraqi Kurdistan as essentially a proto-nation-state, and its accompanying nepotism, corruption, and hyper-capitalist pursuit of profit at the expense of everyday Kurds and minorities, cemented the failures of the nation-state concept in the minds of large swaths of more anti-capitalist Kurds. Sentenced to life in prison, Ojalan began to read, synthesizing his own thoughts with the thoughts of many different thinkers, the American anarchist Murray Bookchin, and the sociologist Emanuel Wallerstein, among others. This led him to the formation of a new ideology, democratic confederalism, which he established in several volumes of his Manifesto for a Democratic Civilization, Democratic confederalism, as he describes it, is democracy without a state, the flexible, multicultural, anti-monopolistic, and consensus-oriented expression of society run through direct democracy and with ecology and women's freedom at its core. This rejects the centralization at the heart of state systems and instead empowers society to run its own affairs on a decentralized basis with the goal of making the state obsolete. Most importantly, it argues that all ethnic groups and religions have the right to organize autonomously, defend themselves, and freely express their culture. Yet through democratic confederal arrangements, these different cultures and lifeways can and should come together based on their common mindset of freedom and solidarity for all people everywhere. Ojalan calls this common mindset the democratic nation and sees it uniting people across the world, regardless of where they happen to be located on a map. With their jailed leader's paradigm shift from advocating a more authoritarian form of socialism to a more grassroots libertarian socialism, the PKK underwent long internal discussions and debates until they finally adopted democratic confederalism as their official ideology in 2005. While many in the West have noted the similarities of democratic confederalism to anarchism, helped by Murray Bookchin's influence on Ojalan, it should be absolutely stressed that these ideas grew out of the specific experiences and worldviews of people in the Middle East, including Ojalan and other PKK leaders and fighters. The PKK did not adopt a Western ideology wholesale, but created their own ideologies based on their experiences and what worked for them. This paradigm shift has been expressed through the massive decentralization of political power through the Kurdish movement to local communes, councils, and cooperatives, run from the bottom up. Most importantly, Ojalan's transformation led him to seeing women's freedom as THE defining problem to struggle against. Not class, not ethnic chauvinism, not the state, but the freedom of women, and all the other problems would have to be dealt with after the struggle for women's freedom had begun, because it was the oppression of women that started it all. This has been the reason that all the grand revolutions and movements of the past had failed, whether in 1840, 1917, or 1968. They had not started where the root problem started, both ideologically, with patriarchy, and physically in the Middle East. The liberation of women is the liberation of society, and it is the Middle East where patriarchy started, according to Ojalan, that patriarchy must be destroyed. Ojalan declared that the 21st century will be the century of women's revolutions, and the women's revolution in Kurdistan has sure kicked off the century with a bang.
Current Influence of the Kurdish Freedom Movement For over 40 years, the Turkish state has tried absolutely everything to destroy the existence of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, and even to deny the existence of the Kurds as a people. With the massive technological gap that came with unpiloted drones, the PKK's chance at some defeat of the Turkish army is pretty much long gone, if there ever was one. But the Kurdish freedom movement has not believed that one side could defeat the other in warfare for a very long time. In fact, the PKK first declared a unilateral ceasefire and end to the war in 1999, and began positioning itself as solely a political movement. During this time, they pushed multiple times for peace talks, but the state declined. They remobilized and ended their ceasefire in 2004 after Turkey launched a large offensive. They started another peace process in 2013 to 2015, but the Turkish state's fear at the success of the YPG and YPJ forces in Kobane, northern Syria, against the Islamic State, and airstrikes on PKK positions in the mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan during that time broke the ceasefire. Again, writing in Democratic Autonomy, Abdullah Ocalan summed up his past statements since 2004, stating exactly how peace could be achieved in Kurdistan. This is what is meant by a peaceful and democratic solution to the Kurdish question. National democratic constitutional compromise based on democratic autonomy status. If the KJK, English KCK, Kurdistan Communities Union, the umbrella organization of the Kurdish democratic confederalist movements, does not succeed in its preferred national democratic constitutional solution with democratic autonomy status based on a compromise, it will make the transition to unilateral democratic autonomous governance as its second preferred option. The democratic autonomous governance in Kurdistan is not a nation state with governance through laws. It is the governance of democratic modernity on a local and regional scale. The movement in Rojava, then called the Kurdish Supreme Committee, chose the unilateral approach in 2012 because of the need to fill the power vacuum in the northeast when the Assad regime mostly withdrew from the territory. They have since transformed into the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria and then the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria as the area under their influence spread as the YPG and YPJ liberated more and more territory from the Islamic State, ISIS. One of the most crucial features of democratic confederalism is that it is no longer, and was never conceived as, a purely Kurdish movement. The Kurdish freedom movement, from the armed wings to the civil society organizations, have always been an internationalist movement, with some of the first PKK fighters to die in armed conflict giving their lives along Palestinian fighters in Lebanon during the 1982 Israeli invasion. Lebanese left parties hosted the PKK in their training camps. 
In the 1990s, the Kurdish movement first made alliances with the Syrian and Syriac movements, pushing for autonomy in their historical homeland, Bet Nahrim, that lies between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and also coincides with much of the area Kurds see as their homeland. These movements adhered to the ideology of Dalranoi, pushing for democratic socialism and autonomy. Their similar ideologies and shared oppression by the Turkish state made them easy allies. The PKK and the patriotic revolutionary organization of Bet Nahrim launched a joint attack against the capitalist and conservative Kurdistan Democratic Party in Iraqi Kurdistan, who had allied with Turkey in their counter-guerrilla operations. By the time the Rojava Revolution came around, the Kurdish freedom movement had a strong relationship with the predominantly leftist and Christian Assyrian Syriacs, though the more conservative of the community tended to side with the Assad regime. Around the time the Kurdish PYD started in Syria, so too did the Syriac Union Party, SUP. More than a decade later, when the revolution broke out, the SUP began to organize democratic autonomy in the neighborhoods where a large amount of Syriac people lived. They formed their own internal security forces, Sutoro, as well as a militia, the Syriac Military Council, SMC, and an all-female unit, the Bet Narin Women's Protection Forces, HSNB. The movement again organized according to Daranoi, which fit in very nicely with a democratic nation because of its practices of radical democracy. The Syriac Military Council, and HSNB, has fought on the front lines in all of the major operations against the Islamic State and the Turkish invasions in 2018 and 2019. They were one of the founding members of the Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, the umbrella for all of the affiliated democratic militias in northeast Syria, including the YPG, YPJ, SMC, and many democratic Arab tribal and other forces under the Syrian Arab Coalition. In fact, Kino Gabriel, an Assyrian Christian, is now the spokesperson of the entire SDF. Arabs have massively joined the Democratic Confederalist Project too, and despite attempts by the Syrian regime, Turkey, the FSA, and ISIS to divide Arabs from Kurds and Assyrians, they continue to flock to the movement. In a recent study of SDF fighters done by journalist Amy Austin Holmes, it was found that almost 70% of the more than 100,000 members of the Syrian Democratic Forces are Arab. Arab women have been slowly but surely joining in larger numbers. Those who want to see the revolution crushed constantly claim that the Arab wing is on the verge of defection and collapse, yet the autonomous administration continues to get support from the tribes, hosting some 5,000 tribal representatives from all over Syria in a conference just this past year. These multi-ethnic, multi-religious relationships are due to democratic confederalism which is based on the self-organization and autonomy of all ethnic groups, religious sects, and communities. The predominantly Kurdish YPG could have seized a monopoly on the use of force from the beginning of the revolution, yet they continue to encourage more cultural sectors to form their own defense forces. An Armenian military brigade even formed on April 24, 2019, the 104th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Unlike the orthodox leftist movements, which immediately dismiss religion as counter-revolutionary, the Kurdish movement, while largely secular, sees spirituality and religious traditions as part of the collective culture of humanity. Churches and mosques can be found on the same blocks all over their territories. Crucial to their pluralist project and their movement for decolonization is their policy that every child in the self-administration areas should be taught in their own language. All official textbooks in Northeast Syria are printed in Kurdish, Arabic, and Aramaic. The regime banned Kurdish language instruction, and only ever allowed Assyrian and Syriacs to learn in their Aramaic language in liturgies, but never in schools. Beyond their own language revitalizations, students are taught the other languages as they get older in an effort to increase understanding and protect the cultural heritage of the Middle East. Not only have members of every ethnic group in the self-administration formed their own and joint democratic commune assemblies, there are also ethnic quotas at all levels of the self-administration based on the percentage of population in a given area. I mentioned the co-chair system in which there is always one man and one woman for every position of influence. It is almost always true that both co-chairs are of a different ethnic group as well. This deep legacy of internationalism that runs through the Kurdish freedom movement also played a big part in the black struggle, specifically with the Black Panther Party. But it is easy to express solidarity with struggles thousands of miles and multiple continents away, 
What is harder is to organize with other ethnic groups that share the same living spaces, compete for the same jobs in the current economic system, and who are constantly pitted against each other by the state system, who benefits from ethnic dissension among people without power. Fred Hampton, the 20-year-old Black Panther from Chicago who made waves for his active organizing of a rainbow coalition between poor whites and black revolutionaries like himself and Puerto Ricans, and who knows how many more sectors had he had more time, was the perfect example of this pluralist solidarity in the black movement. These coalitions had the power to end gang wars and combat street gangs while effectively organizing against the state. But just as the regimes constantly try to inflame tensions between Arabs, Kurds, and Syriacs, so the American government could not stand to see working class people unite beyond their ethnic lines. So they had Fred Hampton killed, and sadly his project fizzled out, its name co-opted by liberal activists and its content watered down. If Fred Hampton had lived, maybe the Rainbow Coalition would have become a central component of the movement and helped its tenacity, just as democratic confederalism would for the Kurdish movement. Without Fred Hampton, the unification of ethnic groups never became more than a side goal for the Black Panther Party, instead of being consistent throughout party ideology and practice. The Kurdish movement's similar but more widespread strategy helped elevate it to the formidable position it has today. While Abdullah Ocalan has engaged in some renewed talks with the Turkish state over the last year or so, those have been cut off again by Turkey's new campaigns against the PKK in Iraqi Kurdistan and the re-isolating of him on his island prison. In Kurdish cities in southeastern Turkey, where they've organized through a local politics municipality approach, nearly every time Kurdish co-mayors from the communes and assemblies are democratically elected, the Turkish state calls them terrorists and removes them, replacing them with a stand-in from the ruling party. In fact, that happened again today as I record this, May 15th, 2020. Since March 2019, 45 democratically elected co-mayors have been removed from office by the Turkish Interior Ministry, and 21 have been detained, according to journalist Jahida Dersim. Just 12 of the 65 municipalities won by the People's Democratic Party, HDP, have not yet been removed after five municipalities were seized by the state today as a gift for the International Day of Kurdish Language. When Turkey invaded northeast Syria, it forced the self-administration into renewed talks with the Syrian regime. The self-administration, a name used interchangeably with the autonomous administration, has always said the solution to the Syrian civil war was a decentralized democratic Syria that accepted the autonomy of their administration and self-defense forces in a new democratic constitution. They have held firm on these points, stating that their goal was never to divide Syria or create their own nation-state. Since October 2019, after the Turkish invasion of Syria, the self-administration and Assad regime have had a military-only agreement to cooperate against Turkey along the borders and have agreed to hold further political talks down the line. Assad, backed by Russia, is publicly adamant that every inch of Syria will be under his control, but from time to time his negotiators seem to be willing to accept some of the self-administration's terms. Meanwhile, in Iraqi Kurdistan, the Democratic Confederalist project still holds little influence outside of the PKK stronghold of the Kandil Mountains, the completely self-organized refugee camp at Mahmur, currently under complete embargo by the KRG, and the Sinjar Mountains where the Yazidi forces who formed after the ISIS genocide still get constantly bombed by Turkish drones. Yet despite the precarity of all of these sectors of the movement, their sense of hope is nearly insurmountable. They've achieved more than anyone but their own people could have ever believed they were capable of in face of some of the world's worst repression. And whatever the outcome, the democratic nation has been unleashed, and thousands of internationalist volunteers from all over the world have directly traveled there to join the revolution and take skills and lessons back home, whether military or civil. Their fight against the Islamic State and their women's revolution their grassroots democracy and their ecological struggle has captured the hearts of millions of supporters from just about every country in the world. Sit by my side, come as close as the air. 
sharing a memory of gray and wander in my words dream about the pictures that I play of changes green leaves of summer turn red in the fall to brown and to yellow they fade and then they have to die trapped within the circle time parade of changes Changes in Ideology and Current Influence in the Black Freedom Movement In 1970, shortly after he was released from prison to celebrations by the widely popular Free Huey campaign, Huey P. Newton spoke at Boston College to a decidedly mixed-raced and welcoming crowd. In his speech, he introduced his new political theory of revolutionary intercommunalism, moving the party away from revolutionary internationalism in a world where the ruling circle of the United States, has violated every nation. According to Huey, the police are everywhere and they all wear the same uniform. They had denied the self-determination, economic determination, and cultural determination of every nation, and so the party couldn't be in solidarity with the nations of the world because, in their words, there were no longer any nations. A shift in the global condition also required a shift in the party condition. From here, they had to shift away from a focus on nation-states and towards communities. Revolutionary intercommunalism still had the goal of world revolution, but the outcome of that revolution would now aim towards a cooperative framework of interdependent socialist communities worldwide. Unfortunately, Huey's ideological shift towards a more decentralized and autonomous one failed to spur on the decentralization of the party internally. The internal dissension State repression and unaccountable leadership caused major splits in the Black Panther Party less than a year after Huey's proclamation of revolutionary intercommunalism, and these ideas would be heartbreakingly overshadowed. But they do live on today amongst movements and organizations specifically inspired by the Black Panther Party, like the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, Alpha Company, an independent branch of its parent organization out of Dallas. In an interview with Revolutionary Left Radio, members of the Alpha Company spell out their interpretation and development of intercommunalism. And he he, he was trying to understand uh, how do you build power in the United States or in other developed countries or undeveloped countries in the face of like this overwhelming imperialist capitalist power. And if you want to develop your own nation, which is where the Black Panther Party initially started out, And you have to be able to develop power. You have to be able to have a force and all of these different things. Um, But what he found was like, it was difficult to do that. Um, It was difficult to try to develop a nation within another existing nation. And and so we reverted to this idea of communities as, as the unit in the community, you know, there, there's power there. You can organize, you can actually build a foundation. They also add some historical context pointing to Huey's ideological break from the Marxist-Leninism popular in the day. So, so during the 1960s and 70s, when Huey P. Newton uh, introduced his idea of intercommunalism, uh, it was during the internationalist, like Marxist-Leninist movement. And he did introduce this idea of, of intercommunalism to move the Black Panther Party away and himself away from that movement. And the idea when you have like state socialism, or you have internationalism or international socialism, it is a requirement that you think about it in in terms of the state. And so when you take the state out of the equation, when you're thinking about socialism, then you you end up with one of the three tenets, right? You end up with with anarchism. Um, And my personal belief is that in 1970, when Huey P. Newton introduced the idea of intercommunalism that he had developed his theory and his analysis to the point to where he was basically making an announcement, even though it was understated at the time, that he no longer believed that state socialism or international socialism, based on the idea of of revolution by a state itself, was the necessary form of revolution, and that instead, uh, the requirement of what was needed is that you focused on the community on smaller geographic areas. 
If the Alpha Company's interpretation of intercommunalism is correct, Huey was moving ideologically in a similar direction to Abdullah Ocalan almost 30 years earlier. The failure of socialist movements to have any success using the state as a vehicle to eventually achieve a stateless, classless society transformed Huey's focus to building up the capacity for communities to govern themselves and to coordinate with other liberated communities. Though steeped in the rhetoric of the late 1960s, intercommunalism as described here seems very much in line with Ojalan's democratic confederalism, and it is a shame that the power of the Black Panthers fizzled out before they were able to implement these new ideas more fully. While the Black Panther Party no longer exists, its members and its legacy live on and are reflected in the organizing today. The Panthers introduced many ideas that have either been carried ever since or are being reborn once again including the embrace of a diversity of tactics and the acceptance of armed self-defense, the privacy of the information war, the importance of cultural survival and roots to struggle, and the need to be in a community organizing amongst the people themselves. But today's movements have had to grapple with the shortcomings of the Black Panther Party too. The failure of the Panthers to completely combat patriarchy within the party and the importance of women's self-organization are lessons that the Black Freedom Movement has taken to heart since the Panthers' demise. Autonomous women's organization has reached new heights with groups like Black Women's Defense League and Asada's Daughters. As of now, the Black Women's Movement is spread out among a lot of different organizations and tendencies. It remains to be seen if these formations will organize in a way that is both autonomous and given elevated status, yet fully integrated within the broader movement like Congress Star and the YPJ in the Middle East. Many of these organizations have grown out of the increasing demands for female and queer self-organization as a backlash against the tendency of the Black Lives Matter movement early on to focus much more on the deaths of black men at the hands of police than of those of women or trans people. A push from women in the broader movement has led to online hashtags like Black Women Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter. These organizations are still in their infancy. Black Women's Defense League was founded not only as a response to police brutality and white vigilante violence, but also to protect black women and trans women from patriarchy and abuse in their own communities. The same factors that led Kurdish, Arabic, and Assyrian women to organize their own autonomous defense forces both in their communes and neighborhoods, the HPCJ and Asayish Jin, drive these women in Dallas, Texas. In fact, Black Women's Defense League, BWDL, was formed by a former member of the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, HPNGC, which as I mentioned was inspired by the Black Panther Party. She left HPNGC after her reports of abuse from an important member were downplayed. Sadly, it seems that at least as of 2015, Huey P. Newton Gun Club had not taken strong enough steps to address the patriarchy that plagued their namesake. They dismissed it as not just related to the plight of women, as men are the victims of abuse as well. A true statement, as is, all lives matter, but both statements are dismissive of the actual situations being discussed at the moment. I should add that it has been women's movements that have been talking about how power relations hurt both women and men for decades upon decades, whether in America or Kurdistan. The words of the gun club calling Black Women's Defense League a male-bashing feminist movement make it clear that their failure, at least at that time and in the parent organization, to address patriarchy was not based just on one situation, but was more systemic. While the Black Women's Defense League takes the arms and the survival programs from the Panthers, their focus seems to be more about building community autonomy and safety rather than seizing the state. I should be clear that they are unmistakably revolutionary, but their prison and police abolition activism, their focus on transformative justice, and their trainings on emergency preparedness and survival point towards a strategy of making the state obsolete, rather than using state power as a tool of their own. In this way, they build revolution by contracting new relationships, by creating the institutions that form a real society and community, instead of reproducing the same old state power within themselves. The Rojava revolution in northeast Syria, led by Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, and Yazidis, shows what happens when these new relationships build a strong enough web to catch everyone and keep them from falling in the cracks when a power vacuum opens up. 
we can see that the most transformative revolutions, from Spain in 1936, to the Zapatistas in Mexico since 1994, to Rojava since 2012, all built dual power infrastructure that materially made the lives of the people better in the meantime, but was also prepared to seize a moment and insert themselves when state power's ability to control waned. As climate change, natural disasters, and partisan division weaken the capability of the state to effectively hold monopolies over all their territories, more and more vacuums open up for weeks, months, even years at a time. In the United States, those sacrifice zones are most likely to be in predominantly black or non-white communities, from New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, Flint, Michigan with the water crisis, whole swaths of the Rust Belt, or Puerto Rico. All of these spaces opened up new possibilities when the state lost grip. In the midst of those disasters, spontaneous action has created networks of people caring for each other and meeting each other's needs without the state, defending themselves against police and white supremacists too, as was the case in New Orleans. Imagine what could have happened if prior to those disasters, the whole society had already been mobilized in their neighborhoods, already meeting each other's needs, transmitting endangered cultures, mediating family feuds, decentralizing medical and health knowledge, and so on. The prospect of one big glorious proletarian revolution is dead. The revolution is a million little revolutions here and there, as people take more say over the decisions that affect them into their own hands. There is one place where this kind of dual power has taken a bigger hold in the black freedom movement than anywhere else. That place is Jackson, Mississippi, where Cooperation Jackson is well underway in carrying out its municipalist strategy. Municipalism is a growing worldwide movement focused on cities taking more direct control of the decisions that affect their residents and usually emphasizes the decentralization of power through direct democracy in the neighborhoods, as well as the localization of the production of goods and services. Some, like Murray Bookchin, the anarchist-turned-communalist who was one inspiration for Abdullah Ojalan, advocate municipalist parties running candidates purely in local elections in order to defang the representative elements of the government while empowering the neighborhood councils that elect and mandate the candidates. This strategy is opposed to electoralism at the state or national level, but sees local elections as strategic battlegrounds municipalists shouldn't be afraid to engage with. The Kurdish movement in Bakur, southeastern Turkey, used this idea effectively as well, until the Turkish state responded with a full military siege of their cities. But Cooperation Jackson is no stranger to the kind of state repression that their municipalist movement might incite. They grow out of the Malcolm X grassroots movement and the New African People's Organizations, who themselves grew out of the aforementioned Republic of New Africa. While cooperative economics has long been a part of the New African movement's plans for a post-revolutionary society, Cooperation Jackson too has ditched the old focus on seizing state power to create some sort of black nation state, and instead has turned to living cooperative economics, living direct democracy, living black autonomy, and living ecology in the here and now. Not only is this shift possible because of the discrediting of revolutions through state power, but also because of the popularization of non-hierarchical forms of organizing. The highly centralized and hierarchical model of big party organizing in the United States seems to have been thoroughly discredited. Subsequent waves of organizers in the country have learned from both the top-heavy Black Panther Party and the radically decentralized Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The Panthers' hierarchical nature, in line with most of the global left at that time, including the PKK, hindered local autonomy and made the organization quite rigid when it needed to be flexible. The best example for this is the draining of most party resources from each of the various city chapters to Oakland's electoral campaign in 1973 because Oakland was where the party headquarters was and the HQ had such a firm and unquestionable leadership structure that such an order was followed. And when Huey P. Newton came back from prison and fell into a cycle of power-hungry, drug-addled paranoia, he was able to organize a personal posse of enforcers of his iron will that destroyed the party's image among many of the working class people they had once recruited and even among longtime Panthers. Not only that, but the FBI could easily find handles to grip and pull from every direction with such easily noticeable and powerful leadership. The people at the top could be arrested, killed, pit against each other, or scandalized, each time leaving unfixable wounds in the party structure. SNCC, on the other hand, used participatory democracy to make decisions and rejected hierarchy. 
This kept individual autonomy in the chapters and allowed for fluidity. The 1970s anti-nuclear weapons movements, the 1990s alter globalization movement, and Occupy Wall Street, all embracing decentralization and consensus or direct democracy, paved the way for the Black Lives Matter movement, most of which organizes power from the bottom up instead of the top down. With such a bottom-up approach, Cooperation Jackson has built some of the most inspiring and thoroughgoing community infrastructure seen anywhere on this continent, from food cooperatives to freedom farms to their own community production labs, where any resident can come make the tools and goods they need to survive and thrive. The heart of their organizing is in the People's Assemblies, which they use for two purposes. The first is to make directly democratic decisions on all sectors of daily life, so that community members can govern themselves. But as I mentioned, Cooperation Jackson also sees local government as institutions that have real power right now and that would be perilous to ignore. For this reason, they also use the People's Assemblies to directly draw candidates from the ranks of the Assemblies themselves. Theoretically, the Assemblies would define exactly what the community wants and doesn't want those candidates to do in local office and would have the power to recall them for violating that mandate. After all, their whole purpose of running candidates is essentially to water down and negate the repressive powers of the state. This is from the Jackson Cush plan directly. But in practice, when a politician gets in office, no matter at what level, they are very hard to rein in. Municipalism, as it was defined in the Jackson Cush plan and by Murray Bookchin beforehand, synthesizes the weariness of state power of anarchists and the viewpoint of the state as a necessary but evil tool by Marxists into some sort of compromise that rejects all higher bodies of state power, uses a limited amount of local state power as long as it is tied to and accountable to directly democratic assemblies, and relies on those assemblies' own power for most everything else. The movement argued in the plan that the autonomous institutions capable of taking on the state were primary, while electoral politics would garner a limited focus. However, Kalia Kuno, the spokesperson for Cooperation Jackson, has shared that the organization thinks back on the electoral path they took as a mistake. In July 2017, Chokwe Ambar Lumumba was elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, on the promise to make Jackson the most radical city on the planet. His father was elected mayor in 2013, but served one year before his death under somewhat mysterious and unexpected circumstances. The family had been involved in the New African Movement for many years, and Chokwe Antar rode to power through the support of the People's Assemblies. But like with the Black Panther Party's 1973 electoral campaign that had forced the party to drain all of its resources from their autonomous institutions, Kali says that the broader objective of the People's Assembly as an autonomous vehicle for self-governance, and the mayoral campaign being just one part of that, has been lost or ignored, and not pursued by forces claiming to adhere to the Jackson Cush plan, likely referring to the mayor himself. The mayor had been elected with promises to fight austerity, but like with so many leftist elected officials, the momentum of the capitalist system and its needs forced Chokwe Antar to administer the very austerity he sought to oppose. The focus of the movement became during this period how to retain power and win more elections, and not how to keep moving forward with building real autonomy. Learning from this, Cooperation Jackson hopes to regenerate the People's Assemblies as the backbone of their infrastructure building plans, all of which will be decided and governed by the people directly. In addition to the Freedom Farms Cooperative and a landscaping cooperative they currently run, they have plans to open many more cooperatives for services like recycling and ecological health in the near future. I already mentioned their huge community production cooperative, which is open to the community and is almost like a mini factory controlled directly by the neighborhood, with its own 3D printers, coding programs, and the like. They hope to use this cooperative to fabricate affordable eco-homes, which they will supplement with cooperative housing buildings and add to their Fannie Lou Hamer Community Land Trust. The goal here is to ultimately have a live-work, multi-use eco-village where the land will be removed from the speculative market, the land will be put to communal use, and what happens on the land will be decided democratically by the whole community. And these plans aren't just talk either. The fabrication lab has already been purchased and is currently being used to make masks for the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
they have also purchased the space for a soon-to-be cooperative grocery store. And two community centers are right there on the same street, one owned by Cooperation Jackson and one by a local church with which they have a good relationship. The land trust surrounds that same street and has already taken eight blocks of houses off the market and under resident control. We've got a, an eight block area where we're working to build a sustainable model neighborhood from the inside out ground up using all of our blighted and abandoned property and the skills of the people that live here. We build everything using only salvage materials. The whole idea is like to use construction, um, food, food production and folk art to renew and revitalize the neighborhood. We moved here four years ago and we bought a house. We bought this house here for $1,500. Everybody's extremely poor, nobody's working, about 90% unemployment rate. We started having neighborhood meetings and what we realized really quickly was that everybody could articulate where they would go if. Mm -hmm. If they had more money, if they, you know, had a better job. That's how we started like saying, okay, well, you know, if they can see what their ideal place would be, well, why not start organizing with that saying like, look, you know, we can own this space and we can start to create what we can see. We did a skills assessment and we found that 90% of the residents actually have a farming background, a farming skill. And we had a lot of land. And this where the farm is, was the neighborhood dumping ground. And the people wanted to figure out how to clean it up. So we decided to put a farm there that actually looks like a landscape cottage garden because of the trauma associated with farming. So that is like a big part of our challenge is like getting people, although they have that skill, back into growing food you know, to make money. Because that's, that's like the number one thing that people want to do here is they want to make money. We have like a main street. So right now we're working to build a neighborhood economy. So we have to be able to make the place feel safe enough for people with disposable income to come in and buy products that we produce. We have a youth apprentice program. So we work with the neighborhood youth, you know, teaching them different skills. So everything that is done here is done by the people that live here. We call it neighbor labor and they're paid. As we start to make the place feel safe, that's when organized capital comes in and displaces people. So we bought all of the vacant land. Uh, so we own 65 properties as a neighborhood collective. It's more like a quiet radicalism, our approach, you know, because we're not ready to raise our head. You know, you raise your head, it gets chopped off. You know what I mean? So we're kind of quietly here building an infrastructure that will be able to resist the forces that we know will come as soon as we build something that is really great. A core part of the program is doing the community land trust so that we decommodify land as much as possible. Eventually we'll take more and more people away from the urgency of having to worry about having a roof over my head and paying ground rent and paying rent you know, which pushes you and drives you in a certain sense to have to engage the market on the market's terms. It has to become a communal entity and something that we create communal rules around how to use, how to protect, how to preserve, how to regenerate. And that's how we wind up getting this building and then using this as a base to grow out and expand. West Jackson, from the culmination of efforts that date back to the new African movement of the 1960s, has built autonomy unmatched in the United States. They have situated themselves and their history as black people, their specific needs, and the revolutionary movements that have come before them. They have built on that knowledge and built a mini society that people that live there control themselves, based on direct democracy, ecology, and black empowerment. As their autonomy grows, the people there will have less and less need for the state and the commodity market until those forces have very little reach into their community. Of course, state power will want to capitalize and extend their power there as long as it has the means to do so. But that's where the expansive definition of self-defense as popularized in Kurdistan comes in. From community education, to civil disobedience, boycotts, autonomous infrastructure, and even armed defense. Organizations like Cooperation Jackson and Black Women's Defense League represent just some examples of the recent turn in the Black Freedom Movement towards autonomous and democratic revolutionary projects which help oppressed people escape from the reach of power's tentacles and bolster society at the expense of the state. They seem to follow in line with the movements in Rojava and Bakur and all over Kurdistan, who rely on their own society's will, strength, self-defense, and care for each other to make it through instead of dependency and assimilation. How far the Black Freedom Movement, and thus the freedom movement of all people, 
moves forward will depend on their ability to link up with one another and unite around a democratic nation. Instead of the old, outdated model of nation-states based on specific geolocations or languages or ethnicities, the choice of a democratic nation whose membership requires only a common mindset of freedom and solidarity for all people everywhere will help us make all the powers that dominate us obsolete. You've been listening to episode 5 of Panthers and Gorillas. Thanks for taking the time to do so. This episode features four songs. The opening song was Efrin Tola Salam by Memul Birazi and the folks at the Rajava Film Commune. This was the anthem of the Berkodana Sademe, the resistance of the age, against the Turkish state when they invaded and occupied the predominantly Kurdish region of Afrin in early 2018. Then we have Ay Dil Bare by Aram Tigran. Following that, we have Changes, a song by Phil Oakes, one of the most prolific topical singers in America during the 1960s. And finally, you are now hearing Otis Redding's version of Sam Cooke's classic anguished expression of the African American experience, A Change Is Gonna Come, which I also chose as the title of this episode. We will be back next Wednesday for our sixth and final episode. See you then. No time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it is. Just like I said, I went to my little bitty brother. Dear mother, old man. I said, mother, I said, mother, I'm down on my knees. But there was a time that I thought, Lord, this could last a very long time. Somehow I thought I was still able to try to carry on. It's been a You've been listening to episode 5 of Panthers and Gorillas. Thanks for taking the time to do so. This episode features four songs. The opening song was Efrin Tola Salan 
by Mehmood Birazi and the folks at the Rojava Film Commune. This was the anthem of the Berkodana Sademe, the resistance of the age, against the Turkish state when they invaded and occupied the predominantly Kurdish region of Afrin in early 2018. Then we have Ay Dilbere by Aram Tigran. Following that, we have Changes, a song by Phil Oakes, one of the most prolific topical singers in America during the 1960s. And finally, you are now hearing Otis Redding's version of Sam Cooke's classic anguished expression of the African-American experience, A Change Is Gonna Come, which I also chose as the title of this episode. We will be back next Wednesday for our sixth and final episode. See you then.